All right, good morning, everybody. My name's Trey Rossig, and I'm here to tell you today why I think that there is an inevitable move towards vertical power delivery to high-performance computers coming to a system near you. The reason is actually relatively simple. So imagine you have a, a water pump, and the water pump is, on the in, is on the, being fed by a pipe, right? And every year, you double the size of the water pump, and you get more power out of it. And then you double it again, and you get more power out of it. You keep doubling and doubling, at some point it becomes diminishing returns because the pipe can only feed that pump so much water. The same thing is happening now on the PCB. The PCB is the pipe and these high performance servers are the, the water pump. There's literally, we've had customers just tell us flat out, we have to slow down our processors because we can't get enough power to them, period. This is gonna mo push a move towards vertical power uh, in my opinion. So first, and I apologize, this, I am actually targeting this talk at folks who don't have a lot of power experience. I'm trying to explain why this is important. So if you do have a lot of power experience, kind of bear with me. Traditional um, power delivery is basically a power converter is sloshing energy between inductors and capacitors in such a way that you take a high, high voltage and a lower input current and a low voltage at a higher, at a higher output current to the, to the processor. Now historically, these inductors have sat outside the, the heat sink, the chip, just over on the board where the power conversion happens and that power flows into the board, into the chip, excuse me, through the board from the sides. And this has been the topology since the dawn of time, or at least since I got involved in power circa 2000 or so. Um, but the inductors are big and you have to keep them outside and this has worked just fine for a very long time. But one thing you've noticed, particularly in recent years, is this field of capacitors underneath the chip has gotten denser and denser, and there's more of them, and it's denser. And the reason's simple. Um, you're bringing in this power from the outside edges of the board, and it's mathematically not the best analogy, but you can think of it almost like an airplane wing. And the longer that wing is, and the base of the wing is pretty stiff, but out at the tip of that wing, that puppy can wobble around a little bit to disturbances. The capacitors are here in this case to sort of fortify the end of this power distribution network, we call it, where if there is a disturbance out on the end, the capacitors kind of make up the difference. And over the years, these processors have gotten more and more and more powerful, requiring more and more capacitors to sort of hold up the end of that power distribution network. Um, and that plan is running out of steam pretty quickly. So the loads on these processors are very dynamic, right? You've got overclocking stuff going on, you've got parts of the chip going dark, suddenly lighting up to do a bunch of calculations and then shutting it back down again. So it's pretty easy to have a chip that'll do 1,000 amps, then suddenly it's at 1,200 amps, then it's at 2,000 amps, then it's back down to 1,000 amps. The trick is that every time one of these disturbances occurs, the voltage supply, as seen by the chip itself, that part's pretty important, um, bounces around. So we're not talking about here the voltage as seen at the output, this voltage regulator, we're talking about at the chip itself, right? So what happens is, is the chip goes from say 1,000 amps to 2,000 amps. The VR is still back at 1,000 amps. So now the voltage starts to droop and the local caps begin to feed it. But then that starts to droop and then the next caps down the line begin to feed those and then the next caps down the line and so forth, working its way back to the VR. The whole time, the VR is doing its best to get up to that 2,000 amps. So what you always see in these transient responses is sort of this ringy period that consists of the sort of the, 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 the passive response of the power distribution network, followed by kind of a, a, a turnaround, and the turnaround is the point at which the VR got to the 2,000 amps. But now the voltage is low, and so the VR actually has to go a little bit past the 2,000 amps to get it back up into, sta into stability and then kind of get the whole thing kind of uh, flatlined. Now, this plays an important role in computing power because the chips, you know, back in the day, if this, this thing drooped too far, you got blue screen of death. Today, you don't get blue screen of death. You have brownout detectors that watch the stability of the supply. If you drop below your, your timing constraints and so forth, it'll basically say, I'm not gonna trust any calculations until this is done, but there is an overhead time associated with these voltage deviations during which you're not getting the computing power you want. 
So the, the length, the, the performance of this voltage regulator system directly affects the compute power. Now there's two aspects of this. There's the height and then there's the distance. So the height says, well, if I want to cheat, I can just raise the voltage up so it never drops below a voltage I care about. But if you do that, you're taking a huge static power hit, but you can get away with that. The other part is the duration, where you know, every time I have a change, I have to wait X amount of, hopefully nanoseconds, but usually microseconds, before I can start doing some real computation. In the high performance systems, these are the curves that your power delivery engineers are spending all of their time trying to optimize, okay? So as, as far as sort of the story of PCBs being the bottleneck, one aspect of it is, the, is this transient response. You've got a height of the transient response and you've got a duration of the transient response. The other is just lateral delivery losses. So back when we were running 100 amps on a chip, you run 100 amps from the side of the, the board into the chip, okay, fine, right? But now, fast forward to where it's 1,000 amps. Remember that the losses go with current squared. So when you go from 100 to 1,000, you've got 100x the amount of loss in that board, and it's getting untenable right now. Um, so there's two aspects to the, where the current, the traditional power delivery system is kind of falling flat. It's both the transient performance, which is actually slowing down processors, and this, these lateral losses, which are making the boards very, very hot. At that point, enter vertical power. So vertical power says, hey, look, instead of having everything come in from the sides, let's just move everything underneath. Let's co-package all the inductors and the capacitors and get them to fit right up underneath the, the, the processor in general. So right away, you get an, an improvement in your PDN, your, your power delivery network, right? So now, instead of having these capacitors and those capacitors and those capacitors all being you know, separated by parasitic inductances and so forth, you're much more point blank range to the VR. You've taken the airplane wing and you've brought it way in, so it's much stiffer now, right? You don't wanna fly in the thing, but for power delivery, it's pretty good. Now you've got a height. Now the, the initial height, this first droop, that's kind of a function of whatever is inside your chip and to a lesser extent what's inside your package. That's, that doesn't change. But the VR recovery, if it has the bandwidth, we'll get to that in a second, the VR recovery and the natural time that it takes for the, uh, the VR to propagate its output to the actual chip itself is vastly reduced. But the bandwidth is an important thing. At the end of the day, if you have a fast switching converter on the far side of a large PDN, the PDN dominates and you're still slow. If you have a slow switcher on the far side of a, of a short PDN, the switcher dominates and you're still slow. In these systems, you are only ever as fast as the slowest thing running around. So to really take advantage of, of vertical power, you have to have the bandwidth. I have seen you know, offerings now that are taking some you know, older 500 kilohertz switchers and they're co-packaging and doing some pretty cool things to get them under the board, but they're not fast enough to lose the caps. So what's actually happening is you're getting fields of capacitors surrounded by little towers of vertical power. It's not really vertical, it's kind of diagonalish, I guess. So it, it's an improvement, there's no question, but it's not the improvement it could be if you have the bandwidth to take advantage of the fact the PDN is so much smaller. The other one, obviously, is the lateral current drops. So your high power current, that last mile, is now, instead of running across the board through however wide uh, um, you know, lanes you had set up for the power, it's running vertically only through a big fat pipe into the chip. There's almost no loss associated with that power at this point. You still have the lateral currents coming in that have to, that have to uh, are converted, you know, that they, they get converted into that supply current, but those are now reduced by some factors. So say we're going from four volts to one volt, the input currents are now one-fourth what they were, which means your losses are 16x or one-sixteenth x what they were. And now you've gained a generation or two at least before you keep turning up the power on the chip and the, that 16 gets made back up again. You got, it buys you some time, shall we say. So the vertical power just inherently, if you have the bandwidth to take advantage of it, takes care of both of these initial bottlenecks. There's also some side benefits. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but if you do have a a sort of a power plane, and you've got an intelligent digital system running around this whole thing so that there's telemetry and feedback on all of these little spots, you can play games like 
you know, got a hot spot, you know, you've got four cores on the chip and the, 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 the core up at the top right is, is going gangbusters, you can do a local conversion there to reduce the amount of recirculation you have in this plane, which further improves, you know, further improves efficiency, but you can also play games for reliability and some other stuff. I could do a whole talk on this and probably will someday, but it is a sort of an extra added side benefit to going truly vertical. And then the density improvements, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. Clearly, you, you've gained a lot of space, right? This is more functions, it's better power lanes coming in, it's, it's whatever, it, it's, uh, this one's kind of a no-brainer. Nothing, however, is free. There is a cooling trade-off when you start going to a vertical power solution. The, if, we're, if we're running, say, 90% efficiency, the conversion itself is going to generate ballpark 100 more watts of power. And that was true before, right? 90% off on the side versus 90% underneath. Yeah, you know, 90% is 90%. But in the traditional solution, the adductors were way off on the side. The, the actual power conversion was very kind of distributed. The density of that heat generation was both distant from the load and not that dense, right? So that wasn't a big deal. When you go vertical, this becomes a bigger issue. Now you're on the back side of the board, you're generating the same power, but you're generating it in a small space right underneath your load. If you don't have a cooling solution that takes care of that, that heat's gonna run up through your load out to the top side cooling solution. It's gonna reduce your, you know, basically it's gonna drop what effective temperatures you can run at and so forth, assuming that you're designing the system to run at a constant temperature on the junction in the, in the chip. So one of the key things, actually one of the points I kinda wanna make from an OCP kind of a standpoint, is that you need some backside space for the vertical power in order to make these systems, you know, uh, realistic, frankly. Um, so the backside space is the key. If you've got, you know, if you've got miles of backside space, you've got all kinds of space for a cooling solution and it's not a problem. But most of the specs have tight, tight specifications as to what can be behind the board. And it's very possible that that will preclude some cooling solutions for vertical power coming forward. But as I've said, you are going to need the vertical power to get the compute speed. So there's, there's a fundamental trade-off here in that, it, ironically, you could have a spec that dictates the amount of space behind a board dictating the power of the processor. And it's a little bit weird, but it's actually not academic. We've had customers flat out, we have to turn down the speed of our processors because we just can't do it the way we've been doing it. So that's one of, the, one of the key points I wanted to make here is exactly that. And then, you know, looking forward, um, the bottleneck today is the PCB. Keep turning up the power. What happens next? Now the package becomes the problem. And this is already this stuff's already in the works. You know, Intel's done this already. We've got parts that do this. The um, it's eventually going to be necessary that you have in-package power as well. You know, a few years back when we were actually first playing with these things, we were kind of considered a little bit nuts. Uh, nowadays, people were not very accepting of the concept back then, shall we say. Uh, nowadays, they're a little more accepting. Uh, people can kind of see this coming. So this is also coming down the pike, probably a little bit of a less of an issue from an OCP standpoint though, because this is now inside the package you're trying to, trying to power up in the first place. So the call to action I have from an OCP standpoint is, for the folks who are writing specifications around these things, make sure you're taking this move towards vertical power into account when you're writing the specs because it, it's going to happen. There's just no two ways about it. It's a, it'll, it'll take multiple forms. If I had a crystal ball, I, I could tell you the details. But it, the, you, you actually, to keep the speeds up, something like this has to happen in some form or another. If the specs preclude this, you are painting yourselves into a corner in terms of your processor speeds and whatnot. Um, that's kind of all I have for today. I'm timing it out right on the 15 minutes. Uh, if there's any questions, please yell on screen. Um, I guess the first one is obviously even today lots and lots of capacitors are going inside the package to your point of that yep. um, and and I guess one of the things with going on the back of the board especially when the boards are quite thick is the inductance through the actual vehicles themselves versus coming in laterally sometimes that's actually worse yep. so I, I guess my question is is the on package decoupling enough to get the PDM issues of the the, the vias on when you go on the back of the board um, uh, or, 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 or do you have that inductive challenge? It's uh, so that the, the challenge exists. We don't get to dodge the physics. So there are definitely, I've seen some customers who have nearly no MIM cap on their, sorry, uh, um, 
on chip capacitance, it's a, it's a, a, a fabrication term, um, on their chip. And so in those cases, you are gonna have to have some, the, 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 the very first the very first bit of charge has to come from somewhere. So we have some capacitance, but in those cases, one is gonna need more on there. But typically, particularly in the high power um, systems, they have a lot of on-chip capacitance because otherwise they can't even get through scan test because you're basically clocking, I don't know how many flip-flops at the exact same time, and it's fast enough that it never even makes it off the chip. You know, the, the, the inductance just of the package itself kind of covers it. So all that is absolutely there. The inductance thing you get around with some remote sense and control loop games, but that, 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 that is a real thing. It's not as if it's free. Those vias have to be many and plentiful, yeah. and it's, it's, but it's still not as bad as the sort of the, the, the three mile away kind of a thing. But yeah, you have to deal with that, absolutely. And it is, unfortunately, there is no one size fits all. Actually, I was kind of coming in hoping we could kind of standardize it, and here's a, you know, here's a basic kind of a bandwidth and a set of parameters. We could cover all these different customers, and we're finding that some customers have this, some customers have that, and so yeah, it is still this, the, the classic kind of tuning the power thing that's always occurred, still occurs under this kind of a, this kind of scheme. This is one other question. So go in, you're, you're looking at coming from the backside, but meanwhile the silicon guys are putting the power to the top. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess you're thinking about that. Oh yeah, no, no, absolutely. Like I so said, we have, we have stuff in the works, but not ready for presentation yet. Thank you. I have a question regarding the cooling. Mm -hmm. So as you know, the BPD is on the back side. Mm -hmm. um, so you have co plate to remove the heat. Mm -hmm. so the package for the RGC will be very critical. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to see your brochure is like 2C per watt. Do you guys have plan to improve the packaging for the thermal design to further reduce the RGC value? Absolutely. So we, that's actually one of the things I'm, I'm happy about what we're doing is that we are not just a silicon company. We do the silicon, the magnetics, the capacitance, and the packaging all have to be co-designed at the same time. And it's thermal is a big aspect of that. So we've, we have a bunch of sort of advanced R&D type stuff going on in improving the packaging around the thermals for exactly that reason. And do you have estimation, like, what's the best RGC value you can reduce to, like less than 0.5 per watt? Not off the top of my head, but I can probably go back and do some numbers if you want to touch base afterwards. Okay, awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Hmm? Very educational session. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, one question. So I saw you mentioned about the use the power supply to cover higher bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So you reduce the need for the, like, uh, capacitance and other things. Mm -hmm. So my question is, there's always a trade. I assume when you increase bandwidth, you always had to increase your switch frequency. Yeah. That can increase your power loss. Can you comment about the trade-offs you're playing, like uh, how what's the major consideration factors to decide like uh, power efficiency versus like uh, the, the capacitor number required? Absolutely. So the, the, what you're saying is absolutely true. Again, we don't get to dodge physics. We actually try to, ran, we ran it by the board, but they wouldn't let us, or whatever. So the, the physics is, the, the, if you want to get the switching frequency up, you're going to lose, for folks unfamiliar, um, there's the inductor of the capacitor, and there's also power FETs that are switching back and forth between the two. Every time you switch back and forth, you lose some charge in those FETs. And so if you're switching very, very fast, you're dumping a bunch of current just in those FETs alone. Um, we actually have to pick a process that allows us to get to the switching frequency. You have to maintain, it's like, nine, you know, 90% is kind of the table stakes in a lot of cases, right? Um, we actually choose the process based on where we can get the FETs to the point where we can switch at the speed we need and keep that, maintain that efficiency. And you're right, that is, it does lead us to some expensive processes. Um, but yeah, that, the trade-off is, is selection of FETs. Yeah. All right, thank you all for your time. I hope this was useful. Cheers.